Jane Goodall, who is completely a fantasy of mine, a fantasy of what a woman can be. And uh, we are here at the United Nations. You are an ambassador for peace. You are so many things to so many people. And you have told us that we are all connected. Talking about connection, would you say just a few words about how it all happened to you when you were a little girl in Bournemouth? Oh, I loved animals from the moment I was born. I was lucky enough to have a very supportive mother, as I believe you did. I did. And so when I was 10 years old, I found this little book, Tarzan of the Apes, and I just had saved up enough pocket money. This was in World War II. And I bought it and read it, and of course, fell passionately in love with it. That was what began my dream. I will go to Africa, I will live with wild animals, I will write books about them. I I didn't dream of being a scientist. I was invited by a friend whose parents had moved there. I had to save up money working as a waitress. And then I heard about Dr. Lewis Leakey. And I went to see him at the Natural History Museum. He it was who gave me the chance to go and live with and learn from not just any animal, but the one most like us, the chimpanzee. Who was the first chimpanzee you met? First of all, they all ran away. And <laughs> they'd never seen a white ape before. And we are and one a of the great apes. beautiful one. Well, I don't think How they thought so. You? I was 26, but the first one who began to lose his fear. I named him David Greybeard, he had a beautiful white beard. And he's the one who showed me that chimpanzees can use and make tools to fish for termites. Wow. And that was the big breakthrough because it had been thought by science that humans and only humans used and made tools. We were man the right. tool maker. That's right. So the f- your first chimpanzee was David. David. And that was the beginning of a completely different life. Yes. And the, the lucky thing for me, nobody had done it before. Everything was new. Everything I saw was new. And one of the problems was that people said, well, Jane's never been to university. Uh, how can we believe anything she says? Yet luckily, photographs proved it. And from as, as David Greybeard got more used to me, I began to get to know the other chimps. And so when did the world get to know Jane? When did Jane actually communicate this to the entire world? It was because of David Greybeard's tool using. The National Geographic, Lewis Leakey sent them pictures, and they said, OK, they would fund the project because I only had National money Geographic. Yes. So then gradually I got to know the other chimps and gradually they lost their fear and I began to learn about their complex social life. And you know what's fascinating is in chimp society, just like human society, there are good and bad mothers. And the good chimpanzee mother is affectionate and she's protective but not overprotective. And above all, she's supportive and her offspring do better. The males reach a higher position in the hierarchy, likely to have more offspring, and the females become better mothers and also are liable to raise more kids. Well, then eventually when we get to 1986 at a conference, I realized that right across Africa, chimpanzees were, their numbers were diminishing, forests were going, the commercial bushmeat trade uh, mother's shot to sell chimps to en- for entertainment and back then medical research. And I knew I had to do something to try and help them. I managed to get together a bit of money and visited some range countries. And so I learned a lot about the problems facing the chimps, but I also learned about the problems facing so many Africans living in and around the chimp forests, utterly, you know, the crippling poverty, the lack of education and health facilities. And then I flew over the tiny Gombe National Park where my research is still going on, by the way. And what had been part of a huge forest was now a little oasis of trees surrounded by completely bare hills. Through helping the animals, 
you, you started helping yeah. the men. We started this program, Take Care of Takari, the tiny grant from the European Union, and worked with the people, listening to what they said, not going arrogantly in and right. telling them what we were going to do for them. No, no, it was listen to them, work with our own team of Tanzanians. Right. When did you create Roots and Shoots? You know, it's a lot of hard work helping the people now in six African countries and raising the money to keep carry on with our projects. And all of that would be useless if the next generations aren't going to be better stewards than we've been. And as I was traveling around the world trying to raise money and awareness about the plight of the chimps um, and the people, I met so many young people who'd lost hope. And they thought about the pollution, what we're doing to the planet, the deforestation, the pollution of the ocean. And they said, we feel like this because you've compromised our future and there's nothing we can do about it. And I it. know that you believe very much in hope. You wrote a book about hope. Several. And I, always, and I also know that you tease and you say that you, your name didn't happen by accident <laughs> because it's, co it's good all. All good. All good and good all. <laughs> Not really, but... So now in a hundred countries, more than a hundred countries... No, it's about a hundred. It's 98. We have members from kindergarten through university. We're actually even working with um, retired people now and prisons and things like that. But it's basically youth-driven. And the thing about it is the young people choose their own projects to make the world a better place. And it's... To help people animals and the environment, but a strong message of we must learn to live in harmony between people of different nations, different cultures, different religions, and between us and the natural world. So what I think is absolutely amazing about you is that you went as, as, a, as a little girl, you went to Africa with a dream, and you met the chimpanzees through the chimpanzees, it re the chimpanzees reflected to you. It's like they put a mirror about the human race. And with what you learned, you are propelling through the world. You are inspiring young people to do good and to initiate, to start things that whatever they like, whether it's for animals, people, or environment, and this is like you've created a, a network of goodwill. And a growing network. And it's a growing, that's why it's called Roots and Shoots. And it's a growing uh, network. And I am so enthused myself. And I think it's really important for people to spread the world and tell their children and tell their school and, uh, and uh, try to get as many young people who are roots mm. to push the roots, That's to right. push the, the rocks and to become shoots. Yeah, and already there are many adults now in high places, teachers and parents and politicians and CEOs, and they've been through roots and shoots, and they all say it changed the way we think. What is the legacy that you want people to remember. I think the most important thing is for all of us to realize every single one of us makes some impact on the planet every single day. And we have a choice as to what kind of impact. So if we just think about the consequences of the little choices we make, what we eat, what we buy, what we wear. What we throw away. What we throw away, all of those things. Think about how that will affect the planet. And has it caused suffering to animals or people? Has it harmed the land? These kind of questions. And that's what's going to move us towards a better well, world. Well, if anything, with our meeting, I know that as much as I can, I will carry your flag. Thank you. And I will promote it. That's wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you.